As soon as she heard Makoto's weak, fading voice, something inside Mukuro snapped. From within the shell of despair she had built up, an intense emotion began flowing out. No, this is all wrong. She couldn't hold back that emotion any longer. No, no. And for the first time in her li entire life, Mukuro unleashed a scream into the world. Oh boy, this is getting heated up. I need a drink of water. Wow. This is a very interesting, like, alternate world, I guess. It would have been crazy if this happened in the game. Just the person you were playing as at the entire beginning of the game dies like this. That would have been crazy. As Mukuro fell to her knees and clutched her head, a small shadow started walking toward her back. The stuffed animal that had been under her foot. Monokuma. His claws were extended, and he was no longer walking with his usual waddle. Instead, he moved like a beast, silently stalking its prey, as he slowly advanced within his target's blind spot. As he inched towards Mukuro, Monokuma raised his razor-sharp claws, crouched on his haunches, and suddenly leapt towards the back of her neck. However, just before those claws could reach the paralyzed Mukuro, a dark shadow moved in from the side and swatted those claws away with one blow. I'm guessing that's Sakura? His lunge deflected. Monokuma was sent flying through the air, spinning wildly, before crashing into the wall. Damn you! What are you trying to do? Sakura Ogami, the ultimate martial artist, had just prevented another tragedy. She stood before Monokuma and addressed him in a loud, booming voice. Not only did you attempt to kill Junko for violating school regulations, you even attacked Makoto, who had nothing to do with this. If you plan on continuing to act in such a savage manner, there's no reason for us to play along with your game. Yaki Togami, the ultimate fluent progeny, smirked condescendingly at Sakura. Fool. One could say you've now violated school regulations with your senseless actions. He looked as if he had honestly did not have did not care if his fellow students lived or died at all. Well, she merely deflected the headmaster's attack just now, so I do not think it truly counts as an act of violence. Like Byakuya, Celeste seemed unfazed as she chided him over his words. However, the banter between the two was enough to stir the stunned students into action. M Makoto! Sayaka was the first one to run towards Makoto, who lay bleeding from his stomach. But Monokuma stopped her, shouting in a tone of voice that seemed completely out of character. Be careful, don't get too close to those two. Huh? Started by Monokuma's desperate tone, Sayaka and the others stopped moving almost instinctively. The students looked around at each other, instead of his usual playful gait, Monokuma walked toward them with a deliberate, methodical steps. And then, he suddenly blurted out something that took everyone, including Mukuro Ukusaba, by surprise. I'm sure you're probably confused by this sudden turn of events, but I want you guys to work together. As Mukuro slowly turned her head toward Monokuma and pointed at her and yelled, he pointed at her and yelled, Mukuro Ukusaba and her accomplice, Mukuro Nagi, are the terrorists responsible for locking you all inside the academy. Once again, time stopped for Mukuro. But this time, she wasn't the only one affected. Everyone seemed to be frozen in shock. After a few seconds of silence, Aoi Asahina, the ultimate swimming pro, spoke first. Huh? Y you're kidding, right? I mean, Makoto is a terrorist? That's impossible. And who's Mukuro anyway? I mean, that's Junko. Monokuma began slowly explaining to Aoi. This real, uh, the real Junko must be in prison somewhere in this school. Worst case scenario, she might be killed. Mukuro must have researched which one of you would be the easiest for her to impersonate, and hit among you all by pretending to be her. She was probably trying to make sure the killing game went smoothly. Suddenly, Monokuma's hands and feet began jerking in an awkward motion as he looked at the other students and introduced himself. I am Bashiki Madurai, the ultimate hacker. Okay, I don't know who this is now. Interesting. I'm your upperclassman. I hacked into the academy from the outside, and I was finally able to take control of Monokuma's body just a little while ago. Take control? From who? From the head of the terrorist organization that's controlling this robot from the outside. What? What are you saying, Junko? Mukuro trembled as she heard the words coming from Monokuma's mouth. For a brief moment, she clung to the hope that her sister wasn't trying to kill her. 
but as soon as that hope was born, it was immediately consumed by despair. Junko had the power to transform her hope into despair. She would never let anyone hack into her that easily. There was only one explanation. Junko Enoshima was pretending to be someone named Bashiki in order to frame Mukuro and Makoto. It was as though Junko was using Mukuro's survival as a branching path to lead the students to a different despair. Monokuma continued talking, telling the students more lies designed to prod them in, at, into action. On your first day at Homespeak Academy, you guys were exposed to sleeping gas, knocked unconscious, and taken hostage. Mukuro and Makoto pro are probably the only operatives the terrorists sent inside the school. And that means they probably know how to escape from here. And then, Monokuma turned to face Mukuro. Mukuro Ukusaba was a member of the mercenary group called Fenrir. She She's a wanted criminal who's killed over 10 people associated with the school. So don't get soft and think you can capture her alive. In fact, that's exactly what the cops told me. So the moment I saw an opening, I tried hacking the trap they set and tried to kill her. But what about Makoto? Monokuma gave a cold, emotionless answer to Sayaka's question. My guess is that a measly little ultimate lucky student didn't stand a chance of defying a group like Fenrir. He was probably threatened and forced to cooperate before you entered the school. Or, judging from his earlier actions, maybe Mukuro seduced him. Saika's face went pale when she heard that answer, and she immediately stopped talking. Mukuro raised her head and shouted, You're wrong! Makoto isn't a terrorist! You all have to believe me! The whole gym fell silent. And then, as if he were speaking for everyone there, Taka stepped forward and nervously asked, Hold on, what do you mean Makoto isn't a terrorist? It sounds like you are saying there's no doubt that you are, in fact, a terrorist. I ask that you correct yourself at once and say, we are not terrorists. Celeste began expressing her own doubts as well. It is strange. Does it not seem odd that she is so protective of someone we all just met, all just met a few days ago? Mukuro stood in silence. The other students' faces began to fill with suspicion and doubt as they realized they weren't looking at the real Junko Onishima. Yakuya pushed up his glasses and began coldly pointing out what seemed out of place to him. I heard that fool Makoto, or whatever his name is, call you Mukuro instead of Junko. How would Makoto know that your name really is really Mukuro if he just met you not that long ago? Th that's... I've also heard of Fenrir, continued Byakuya. As I recall, its members have a tattoo somewhere on their body. Instinctively, Byakuya's words put Mukuro into a calm state of mind. In hostile situations, her defensive reflexes as the ultimate soldier often manifested themselves. Mukuro's tattoo was on the back of her right hand. She wondered how she could hide something, hide this from the other students without also calling attention to it. But, in the end, this concern was in vain. If the police record are true, she should have a tattoo on the back of her right hand. As Monokuma freely divulged that information. Alright, cried Taka. His voice filled with enthusiasm. Show us the back of your right hand and prove your innocence. Monokuma dispensed another unnecessary remark. Make sure you look real close. She might have covered it up with foundation. Junko had ordered Mukuro to hide her tattoo with foundation, so Monokuma's information was entirely true. There was nothing Mukuro could do except stay quiet. However, there wasn't staying quiet. She wasn't staying quiet because her identity was about to be exposed. She was struck by the realization that her sister was completely serious about pinning this on her. Why the hesitation? shouted the foolishly honest Taka. As my classmate, I have complete faith in you. From behind him, Mifumi Yamada, the ultimate fanfic creator, mur murmured to himself as cold sweat ran down his cheeks. Well, look at that. I guess this is what you really call a checkmate, huh? Why don't you just fess up already, you fucking bastard? In contrast to Hifumi, Mundo Awada, the ultimate biker gang leader, was royally pissed. However, there were some students that were, who were busy questioning Monkoma instead of Mukuro. Hey, you're not coming to save us? shouted Leon Kawada, the ultimate baseball star. You should hurry up and charge in here already. Monokuma looked at Leon and shook his head softly. The police can't help you right now. Not only are you guys hostages, it's possible that the entire school has been rigged with explosives and poisonous gas. I hacked into this Monokuma ro robot to investigate that for myself. Th then what about everyone on that DVD? 
What about everyone outside the school? asked Sayaka. The memory of the DVD she was forced to watch yesterday still weighed heavily on her mind, but... Monokuma didn't have a clear answer. I don't know anything about any DVDs, but there were definitely terrorists causing havoc out there. Law enforcement around the world is in shambles trying to deal with this. That's impossible. Saika shuddered and collapsed to her knees. Sayaka. Next to her, Chihiro Fujisaki, the ultimate programmer, was unsure about what she should do. Behind her, two other girls stood silently. The first was Toko Fukawa, the ultimate writing prodigy. She seemed to be trying very hard not to look at Makoto as he lay bleeding. The other was the quiet girl, who had not talked about herself much, named Kyoko Kirigiri. Unlike Toko, Kyoko was watching everything intently, as if she were studying the scene of the crime. From Makoto's breathing patterns to subtle changes in Makuro's facial expressions, nothing was escaping her attention. Suddenly, Toko began nervously talking to Sakura. So, anyway, let's just say that Makuro woman or whoever over there is a terrorist. Uh, hurry up and be beat her to death or something. We don't know that yet, said Sakura. My fists do not mean out justice, based on a simple speculation. Sakura tried to get near Makoto to examine his wounds, but Monokuma stood in her way shouting, Don't come any closer! This meant that Mukuro was the only one who could get close to Makoto. She had ended countless lives on the battlefield. She knew from experience. If she didn't treat Makoto's wounds, he would die. His wounds were not immediately fatal, but if he continued losing blood, he would eventually slip into shock and die shortly thereafter. Please, you need to treat Makoto first. Absolutely not, said Yakia, harshly interrupting Mukuro. Tying you up and examining the back of your hand is our first priority. Hey, Makoto's in danger. That's not the time for that, said Aoi, uh, as she cast a worried glance at Makoto. She was still having trouble understanding the situation, and hadn't decided if Makoto was suspicious or not. Yakuya was about to snap back at her, but Mukuro's action stunned him into silence. She took a deep breath, and then... Mukuro moved the blonde wig from her head. Where, where there were two long, blonde pin pigtails, only a moment before, there was now short black hair. She cleared her face of all emotion, and when she spoke, her voice rang through, throughout the gym. I'm not Junko Inoshima. My name is Mukuro Ikusaba. The student stared wide-eyed at her open confession. All she did was remove her wig and clear her emotions. But in doing so, the person the students had recognized as Junko Onishima vanished from their sights. The terrorist that had taken her place continued to speak in a calm, stoic tone. I helped lock everyone inside this academy. The confession on a seaside cliff moment has finally arrived, Hifumi blurted out. Whoa, 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 what? Wigs are against the school regulations, Junko. I, I mean, Mukuro, shouted Taka. Oh, that was Taka? <laughs> oh, that's his worry? Wow. As if stirred by their cries of excitement, the other students began clamoring among themselves. Huh? said Yasir. So Makoto's wounds are, like, real? Does that mean the stuff about terrorists and whatever is all real too? So everything that's happened these past few days wasn't a bunch of staged events? And he finally realizes... God damn, Yasuhiro. As the reality of the situation began dawning on Yasuhiro, all Leon could say to him was, Shut the hell up! Byakuya would remain calm and address Mukuro in a condescending manner. What does your group want? If you were after money, you would have already tried to negotiate with me. Of course, I'd rather let them die than surrender to your ransom demands. Our purpose is to fill the world with despair. Byakuya scoffed at this notion and began to speak once again. Huh, I see. Monokuma said something similar. So that ideology is what fuels your terrorism. It's true. If you did anything to me, you would certainly fill the world with despair. But obviously, that would be impossible for you. Aoi couldn't believe what Byaki was saying and frowned as she muttered, How self-centered can you be? After confirming that Byaki had no more questions for her, Mukuro looked at Makoto, whose breathing had slowed, and let her voice show some emotion. But Makoto has nothing to do with this. You can't believe what Monokuma says. What did you say, bitch? Sounded Mon shouted Mondo. I don't know. I don't know what the hell you're talking about. You're a terrorist, just like Monokuma said. 
Makuro looked away from Mondo and continued speaking. That's true, but Makoto isn't involved at all. Celeste coldly brushed her objections aside. I do not think trying to protect him will do you any good. After all, we all heard Makoto call you by your real name. That's... She had no words. There was nothing she could say to protect Makoto, even though Makoto was truly innocent. Though Makuro was the ultimate soldier, her powers were largely limited to battle. In a normal high school student, if an, even a normal high school student could outwit her when it comes to debate and negotiation, if she were the ultimate negotiator, she might have been able to convince them that their memories had really been erased. But in her current situation, she, if she tried to bring up their memory loss, they would think it was a desperate excuse. Even Mukuro knew that. But even as she didn't know what, even if she didn't know what to say, she still knew what to do. Right now, we need to treat Makoto first. And then, she started walking towards Makoto as if nothing had happened. To the elders, it seemed like Mukuro had decided to abruptly change the subject. Hold it. We will immediately take Makoto to the nurse's office for treatment. However, we must tie you up. This was Sakura's honest demand. But there was no way Mukuro could accept it. If she was separated from Makoto, there'd be no telling what Monokuma would do to him. And between Mondo's hot temper and Byakuya's cold heart, Makoto could easily sustain further injuries under the pretense of interrogation. Furthermore, among these students, Mukuro knew she was the only one who had experienced treating wounds due to her time with Fenrir. After mumbling that over, she narrowed her eyes and went silent. Her mind was made up. She was determined to fight her way out of here and escape with Makoto. I apologize, but I do. I need you to fall asleep right now. As she said that, Sakura instantly positioned herself behind Mukuro. She was completely within her blind spot. To a normal person, it would have seemed like Sakura had suddenly vanished. After moving faster than any human being could see, Sakura's equally fast hands launched a blow towards the back of Mukuro's neck. However, sorry Sakura, but I need to get out of here. Mukuro parried Sakura's fist with a spinning roundhouse kick. Sakura raised an eyebrow at the unexpected counterattack. Mukuro tried to use the momentum of her kick to sweep Sakura's feet out from under her. However, Sakura dodged and instinctively struck back against Mukuro's pivot leg. But Mukuro was faster, and jumped up, aiming a tornado kick at Sakura's chin. Sakura deflected the attack with one arm, then both combatants leapt backward, glared, and charged simultaneously. Every blow they dealt was parried and countered by the other, and though they were both unarmed, the sound of the battle echoed throughout the gym. It was like a typhoon had become compressed to the size of a car and set loose inside the gym. The other students were powerless to stop them. All they could do was stare at the breathtaking dance of death unfolding before them. After ten minutes had passed, the enormous sound of one final impact ran through the gym. The two warriors leapt back once again and breathed heavily as they stared down each other. My mistake. Though it's only been a few days, I cannot believe I did not know such an impressive fighter was hiding among us. In addition to the surprise Sakura felt, it was as if the battle had left her energized. Mukuro, on the other hand, looked down at her arm, confirmed I had been wounded during the battle, and thought to herself, She's strong. I don't think Sakura is even taking this seriously right now. Despite being constantly surrounded by firearms, blades, traps, and explosives during her time with Fenrir, this was the first time she had ever been wounded. Mukuro was powerless before the might of a woman known as the ultimate martial artist and the strongest woman in the world. Just as I thought, I can't be Sakura with my bare hands alone. If she had been directly ordered to kill Sakura, Mukuro would have opted to either snipe her from a distance or poison her. At this close range, she would need an assault rifle to stand a fighting chance. I don't have time for this. She looked at Makoto and confirmed that his breathing had grown even shallower. I need to hurry. But at that moment, she had no one to turn to for help. Suddenly, Mukuro had an idea. It was true that getting an ally in this situation was impossible. However, she could still turn one person into her enemy's enemy. Mukuro took a deep breath before she charged at Sakura. And then she immediately fainted and charged at a different girl. Toko who had been cover cowering in fear from the battle between Sakura and Mukuro in the corner of the gym. <sighs> this is bad. Sakura was caught off guard and tried to run after her, but Mukuro was one step ahead and reached Toko first. Huh? Why me? I'm sorry. Wait, hold on. 
Makuro jabbed Toko in her solar plexus and she fell into her arms. Taka and Aoi yelled out in shock. This is bad. She plans to use Toko as a hostage. T Toko! In contrast to their shocked faces, Byaki had just snickered and coldly remarked, <laughs> You fool, do you really think you we care if you take someone we just met a few days ago as your hostage? Oh, he does. yeah, he doesn't know yet. I forgot about that. Byaki doesn't know that uh, it's genocide, Jack. Mukuro just softly glanced at Byakuya and replied, You didn't meet her a few days ago. What did you say? You met her two years ago. Byakuya scowled. Mukuro ignored him and held her bloody arm in front of Toko's face. And then she yelled into her ears, Wake up, Genocide Jack. It seems so random and out of place. Why would Mukuro mention the name of a notorious serial killer right now? The students looked at each other with confusion and when suddenly, Toko, who had been groaning in pain, suddenly kicked off of the floor of the gym with renewed vigor. She leapt into the air much higher than any normal human should have been able to. While hovering several meters in midair, Toko twirled faster than a professional figure skater. This caused her skirt to flutter, revealing multiple pairs of sparkling scissors. Countless tally marks were scratched on her legs, like a kill count carved into a fighter jet. If not for this situation, Toko's glamorous jumps and spins would have been a sight to behold. The girl formerly known as Toko Fukawa cackled wildly. Her red eyes sparkled as her absurdly long tongue flopped out of her mouth. You called for me, and I appear. I've got a murder IOU for you. Oh good. Oh goodness. It has been a while since I've seen Jack. Oh. Tonko? I'm wondering where this is gonna go from here. This is getting really heated right now. The situation had changed so drastically that even Sayaka, who was silent until now, spoke up. Hey, hey, hey. You flash in the pan. Wait, did I- did I read that right? Hey, hey, you flash in the pan. Don't treat Genocide Jack like that depressing little four eyes. That dirty girl doesn't bathe herself at all, so I gotta put- in five times the effort to rub myself down in the shower. Toko's sudden change in personality sent the students clamoring among themselves. Hey, Leon yelled, what the hell does that mean? Monokuma just shook his head. There's some things that even I don't understand. The students continued to panic at the strange turn of events. Toko, now calling herself Genocide Jack, took out a set of scissors from under her skirt and snipped them with glee as she looked around the gym. Huh? Man, it's been a while since I got to stretch my legs, so what were you guys going to do here at the gym while I was snoozing away? Have an orgy? Hmm, I understand. I totally understand. You guys need to need to cut up your clothes so you can feel even naughtier. Yeah, right. Why the hell would I do that for you dumbasses? My sister only meant for cutting the subtle, temp <laughs> the supple, tender flesh of adorable boys. Genocide Jack was causing a ruckus, but when she saw Makoto laying on the floor, she tilted her head once again. Huh? Big Mac, you're like totally about to die. What's the deal? Did you, the world fill you with so much despair that you all came to commit mass suicide? That's so hot, but why are you starting without me? Toko, cried Aoi, get a hold of yourself. Genocide Jack ignored Aoi and moved her emotions and let her emotions run unchecked, jumping and dancing with excitement as she held her scissors. Ah, jeez, I wanted to stab Big Mac's side myself. This spot right here, where the ribs are kind of showing already. He's not even screaming right now, though. What does that mean? Oh well, maybe I can just get used to this feeling of alienation instead. I have no idea what's going on anymore, shouted Yasuhiro. Yeah, dude, Yasuhiro, you have no idea what's going on any, like, at any time. This is all the aliens' fault, goddamn. <laughs> Bringing the aliens into this. Yasuhiro buried his head into his arms, but no one was paying attention to him. I just, this entire time now, I'm just going to imagine, like, there's this very serious confrontation happening, and then you have Yasuhiro in the background, screaming about aliens. So that just, yep, keep that in mind, this entire time. The student's attention was entirely focused on Genocide Jack. Using that to her advantage, Mukuro began sneaking over to Makoto. As she cautiously picked him up, she confirmed that his body temperature was standing, starting to decrease. I can still make it there in time. Though she was carrying another person, Mukuro managed to soften the sound of her footsteps as she ran for the gym's doors. By the time the students heard Mukuro open the door, she was it was already too late. 
she had managed to escape the gym with Makoto. However, not everyone was unaware of what Mukuro was doing. Monokuma saw her movements out of the corner of his eye, but chose not to tell the students. And one other person, Kyoko Kirigiri. She saw Mukuro carry Makoto away, but did not inform the others as she watched them leave in silence. As everyone wrestled with their own personal thoughts and speculations, Hospika Academy began walking a path toward a completely different chaos. <laughs> With Makoto on her back, Mukuro took several trophies from the gym entrance hall, and after passing the door leading to the hallway, wait, she took several trophies with her. Why? That's kind of odd. She jammed the- oh, okay, she's gonna use them here. She jammed the trophies through the door handles, through, uh, though Sakura could easily destroy these makeshift locks, they should buy Mukuro a few extra seconds. I suppose that's a decent idea. Then Mukuro started running to the nurse's office, the place she last spoke to Makoto. Everything necessary for performing first aid could be found there. Her little sister was her enemy. Her fellow ultimate students were her enemy. Her only ally right now was Makoto, who was on the verge of death. Mukuro knew that even she wasn't her own ally right now. Amidst all the chaos, amidst her sister's betrayal and nearly being killed, she believed. She believed she was the only one who truly understood her little sister. That's why she felt like she had to protect her. That's right. You didn't do anything wrong, Junko. You just wanted to feel despair. That's all. Right? Because you love me. That's why you wanted to kill me. You were just trying to feel despair, right? I'm sorry. I'm sorry I failed to bring you despair. But at the same time, she wondered, if... If she saves Makoto and betrays her sister by disrupting her plan, wouldn't that fill her with an even stronger despair? Wouldn't that make her happier? But... Betray Junko. What should I do? Makuro closed her eyes and listened to Makoto's weak breast. What should I do, Makoto? On a battlefield where you all needed to, all you need to do is kill and survive, Makuro was invincible. She could suppress all her emotions and fully immerse herself in killing, and becoming a perfect killing machine. But, on this twisted battlefield of daily high school life, she could no longer keep her emotions in check, especially around her little sister. Mukuro, the ultimate soldier, was beginning to question being ultimate despair. The impulses of the normal high school girl inside her were starting to affect her state of mind. Even so, the poor girl continued to run through the dark hallways, clinging to this conflict within herself. She was now walking along a narrow, hair-thin path, a path between hope, the hope of Makoto Nagi and the despair of Junko and Oshima. Meanwhile, everyone still at the, in the gym was left in a state of complete confusion. Toko was famous for being a prolific author, but even though she came across as unsociable and depressing, her mind-blowing transformation seemed to have just tossed all that aside. Toko is Genocide Jack? Sayaka trembled with fear as Jack tilted her head and struck out, stuck out her tongue. Huh? What's with this reception, you guys? You guys didn't know who I was? Have I been found out? Or have you known all along? And why was... Uh, the <laughs> And why was the soul and samurai dressed like that? That outfit doesn't look good on her at all. The soul and samurai was probably referring to Mukuro. Which means Toka already knew Mukuro in advance. Confronted by that chucking truth, the students had no idea where to begin talking. So many things were clearly wrong by this point. But there were a few students, such as Byakuya and Kyokyo, who opted to remain calm and observe the situation. Alright, someone better spell it. Who gave Makoto an extra mouth to feed? I don't care if you want to stab him or slice him. I just can't forgive whoever put that ugly asshole in Big Mac's side. Toko, no, Genocide Jack spun her scissors in her hands. As she spoke, her emotions and facial expressions constantly changed. Even without the threat of her scissors, she exuded an aura of danger and made her that made her unapproachable. The flank, <laughs> the flank steak. That's a, that's an odd one. I don't think I've heard that word before. Okay, the flank steak of a young boy like Macaroons is. Okay, I'm sorry, this is a weird sentence. The flank stink of a young boy, like Macaroons, is like a blue bird that pops out of a golden egg. If you would've just let me handle it, I would've killed him so good that even Till Till and Mill Mill, Mill Till would be eager to die. 
The poor Makuti's heart and soul have been stomped on by such a sloppy kill. That actually sounds pretty exciting too, but I decline. Toko, you're not making any sense, screamed Aoi. What in the world happened to you? Genocide Jack answered by pointing her scissors at Aoi. What happened to me? I got bored. That's what. That sour pass locked me up the last few days, but when she went unconscious, I thought I'd finally get to do my thing. But when I woke up, but I woke up for all this, my cutie's soaked with blood and I've got no clue what's going on. It's so damn confusing. All I can do is laugh. No one seemed to be able to get a straight answer out of Jack, so Hafumi made a third remark. Or a timid remark. I've dealt with girls like this in my 2D dating games, but this doesn't even compare. It's like there's an SSS difficulty level to clear here. Oh boy. I can't believe you'd even think about her as someone worth clearing, moment Leon. It was clear that things were going nowhere. And as if she were responding to everyone else's expectations, Sakura stepped forward. Hmm, she might be the throes in the throes of confusion. I should try to restrain her for now. As soon as she heard that, Genocide Jack stopped moving, struck out her lizard-like tongue, and gr grinned wickedly. Oh, what's up? Are you really gonna fight me, Battle Ogre? Too bad, my lovely scissors are only for cutting through adorable boys. Women should just stay home. I won't taint my scissors with your filthy blood. Hmm, replied Sakura. It seems my words are useless on you. Sakura entered a fighter stance, determined to restrain Jack, but Jack knew she couldn't win in a fair fight, and adopted a strange stance of her own. In a normal fight, Jack would obviously lose to the ogre, but if Jack focused on just dodging attacks, the outcome of the fight would be hard to foresee. Of course, Genocide Jack's physical abilities were the only were only obvious to a few of the students in the first place. The two women exchanged hostile stares at, as the other student gulped nervously and watched. Except for one person. Kyoka wasn't watching was watching something else. She was watching Monokuma, who was in the corner of the gym, unmoving, as white noise emitted from his speakers. He had stopped moving the moment everyone's attention focused on Sakura and Toko. It's possible that Madarai's hacking had been disrupted, but... An infinite number of other possibilities were also swirling around in Kyoko's mind. She brushed back her hair with a gloved hand and continued to watch. Though she couldn't fully remember her talent, the actions she was taking right now were fueled by pure instinct. Oh, that's interesting. I did not know that. So, the reason she never gives her talent is because I, well... Partially, possibly, because she doesn't remember it. I had no idea that was the thing. So she didn't... So she kind of was in a Hajime position where she didn't remember her talent. Although Hajime was more because he didn't have a talent. But still, you know, it, it's sort of a similar situation. The strange situations that kept occurring in front of her were shaking her to her very core. Her mind worked diligently to scoop up countless amounts of information from her vast sea of memories, and as they were synchronizing with the synap uh, synapses firing from her brain, Sakura and Toka kicked off the ground at the same time, and an intense impact ran through rang throughout the gym. Alright, I had to take a little break there, I felt like my voice was dying. Anyway... Thanks to the heated battle that was unfolding in the gymnasium, Muguro Ikazaba was able to buy more time than she had imagined. As soon as she entered the nurse's office, she rummaged around for medical supplies and did what she could to stop the bleeding. Though still quite shallow, Makoto's breathing slowly stabilized. Mukuro let out a little sigh of relief. However, even though she was somehow able to stop the bleeding, she wasn't out of the woods yet. Miraculously enough, it seemed like none of Makoto's major arteries or organs were damaged. Was this perhaps thanks to his ultimate luck? Or maybe he wasn't actually all that lucky. After all, the only sort of medical treatment he could hope for was partial at best. Mukuro couldn't decide. If only I could do a blood transfusion. The nurse's office should have had several blood packs for transfusions. Mukuro suspected that Makoto's blood type might be written on his e-handbook, but as she reached over to search his pockets... Haha. <laughs> I see you're reaching for a sleeping boy's clothes. What in the world is about to happen next? Adults can keep playing, but you kids better press the B button, okay? Oh, it, uh, I was about to say, who is that? And then I saw the laugh, and I'm just like, okay, I know who that is. Mukuro turned towards the familiar voice and saw Monokuma standing before her. 
You're all alone with Makoto right now. Just think of me as a cute wild animal and let your lust lead the way. As the headmaster, I must prevail, prevent any illicit sexual relationships, but physical education classes are just fine, Missy. Though he looked just like the one that was at the gym, it was clearly a different Monokuma. Multiple Monokumas had been placed throughout the entire academy, so it wasn't a stretch for him to suddenly appear out of nowhere. Regardless, the same person was controlling all of them. Mokuro had been wary of Monokuma's attacking her for a while, uh, her while she was treating Makoto's wounds. But his appearance at this particular moment seemed to take her by surprise. Junko? asked Mukuro cautiously. Monokuma tilted his head, along with his entire upper body, inquisitively. Junko? Who's that? Junko? Never heard of that country before. No more jokes. Answer me, Junko. You were planning to kill me earlier, right? Junko this, Junko that. What's your problem? I'm telling you, I'm Monokuma. You must be a big disappointment if you can't even remember something like that. You're not just a disappointment as a person, you're a disappointment as a sister too. You're too skinny, and your brain is nothing but muscles, and your personality is just unbearable. Uh, um, I'm sorry, said Monk Girl. She didn't need to apologize, but hearing her little sister call her a disappointment, yet again, was enough to make the ultimate soldier recoil. Monokuma ignored her in her current situation, climbed on top of Makoto's barely breathing body, and began poking his cheeks. So what are you going to do with Makoto now? I'm really interested in human mating habits, you know? What are you? asked Mukuro before trailing off. Monokuma lowered his tone and began whispering into her ear. Makoto's a pretty nice guy, huh? He even sacrificed himself to save you. He's so generous, and it's actually that is actually hopeless. He's not dead yet, insisted Mokuro. Despite her firm tone, she couldn't hide the fear lingering in her voice. That's the most disappointing thing about you. You can't even say, I won't let him die. Ah, uh, I won't let him die, Junko. Mokuro could barely get a word in as Monokuma erupted into poo-hoos and ahahas and continued to torment her. As if you could do that. Too bad. No regrets. See you tomorrow. Is this all because Makoto was the first person to smile at you? You, a disappointing, depressing, unladylike, and human killing machine. Despite denying that he was Junko, Monokuma began speaking at length about Mukuro's past. This contradicting way was very much like Junko, and Mukuro was so shaken that all she could do was watch the bear prattle on and on. Only the fit survive in this world. The only thing that kind-hearted people can do is die, you know? As proof, you're gonna watch Makoto die really soon. He won't die. Makuro's tone of voice had become irre irregular ever since she took off her Junko wig. Aside from her conversation with Makoto, everything she said as Junko was far from was from a script that her sister had written. But now, there was no script for Makuro to rely on anymore. Mukuro was treating Monokuma like she would treat her own sister. If the other students saw her acting so weak, they never believed she was the same person that fought Sakura in the gym. And not just that, if anyone from her mercenary past could see her now, her stark change in attitude might make them think she was someone else entirely. Monokuma continued to rail against Mukuro. Nope, he's gonna die. I know it's sad, but you just gotta face the facts. Monokuma wriggled his limbs and danced around and pointed right at Mukuro's face. Because Mukuro is going to die by your hands. Huh? Infighting among the terrorists. The big bad terrorist silences the weak-willed Makoto before he can leak any information. Doesn't that happen all the time? In the end, all the desperate things you said in the gym turned out to be lies you told to escape. Mukuro frowned at Monokuma. You can't do that, Junko. I won't let you do that. As she blurted out those words in a trembling voice, Mukuro was gripped by it with confusion about what she had just said. Am I defying Junko right now? Why? It was a strange feeling. To Mukuro, it was all like she was it was like she was standing on the ledge of a tall building and imagining what it would happen if she jumped. A destructive feeling, akin to holding a friend's baby and wondering what would happen if you tripped and fell. Before she knew it, fear and anxiety had suddenly taken control of Mukuro's heart. That's an odd descriptive feeling before. Akin to holding a friend's baby and wondering what would happen if you tripped and fell. I mean, that, that's kind of sus oddly specific. As a member of Fenrir, 
and as ultimate despair, Makuro had killed innumerable people, and she had handled live grenades before, and she had descended from the sky in a parachute as an anti-aircraft weaponry fired all around her. Her heart never wavered on the battlefield, but now it felt like it could collapse at any second. Monokuma, however, was as stable as a tree, and slightly tilted his head to the side. Huh? Weren't you listening to my story? I'm not the one who's going to kill Makoto, you are. W what are you saying, Junko? Monokuma began giving a strange explanation to a very confused Mukuro. Do you know what the suspension bridge effect really means? It means you push the person you love off a bridge and they'll be yours for eternity. I, I haven't heard that at all. Life doesn't always follow your textbooks, eh? It's sad, but that's what love is. His words made no sense, and Mukuro couldn't think of anything to say as she stood there dumbfounded. Meanwhile, Monokuma continued his little speech, intentionally saying things that are meant to antagonize Mukuro. Basically, this is your big chance, you know? If you kill Makoto right here and now, no one will ever take you- take him away from you again. Oh god. This is, oh boy. Makoto Nagi, dead by dawn. The last name he ever spoke was Mukuro Ikusaba. The last person he ever smiled at was Mukuro Ikusaba. Doesn't that sound wonderful? There was a certain appeal to Monokuma's twisted suggestion, and Mukuro found herself unsure of her own judgment. This is wrong. It has to be wrong. But it's really Junko saying all this, so it doesn't that mean it's right? No, this isn't Junko, it's Monokuma. Monokuma, 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 Monokuma. And are you sure you want to help Makoto? Once he gets better, he's gonna know everything. He'll know what you did to your classmates. I can't believe you would actually erase your friends' memories of their time together and force them to kill each other. Makoto might get mad at you and say, our real enemy isn't the bear, it's her. Do you really want him to blame you for this? I... Mukuro's face turned pale. Or are you going to kill the others? If everyone except you and Makoto dies, you'll be able to spend the rest of your school life together. We can't hold a class trial with only two people. It might be a good idea for you both to live the rest of your lives in this academy forever. No, that's wrong, I... And what are you guys going to do if his memories return? It's not like you were dating Makoto or anything. If you were just watching him from afar the whole time. Or you were, well... Man, you're so shy. You can shoot people's hearts and brains no problem, but you can't even woo some stupid boy into liking you. You want to know who Makoto had a crush on before his memories were taken away? Makuro trembled as Monokuma continued pressing the issue, gradually loosening the screws, keeping her heart secure. So Mukuro chose to pretend she didn't hear anything at all. All emotion vanished from her face, and she looked silently at Makoto's e-handbook. If you're looking for its blood type, it's not written in the handbook. Mukuro's face turned pale. Within five seconds, her plan to ignore Monokuma had already failed. But, since your headmaster is made up of 50% kindness, I'll tell you anyway. Makoto's blood type is B. As soon as she heard him say that, all the anxiety, horror, hostility, malice, and dread churning within Mukuro had completely vanished. Thank you, Junko. Mukuro's eyes sparkled without a hint of suspicion. So she turned her back on to Monokuma without a hint of suspicion, and walked towards the refrigerator containing the blood packs. Is that actually his blood type? Wait, hold on. Don't they... No, the e-handbooks do say their blood type, don't they? I was fairly sure it did. I don't know. No, no, I'm pretty sure it does. I'm gonna have to look that up later. I, I don't remember if they do say the blood type, but I think they do. Fresh blood packs should have been prepared before the plan took effect. But less than cold storage for 21 days, they should still be good. Despite her emotionless face, Mukuro let herself feel a small amount of satisfaction as she took a blood pack from the refrigerator. As Monokuma watched her, his normally emotionless eyes twitched ever so slightly. If a third party could see his face right now, or even if the other students could see his face right now, they wonder. Is Monokuma... Surprised? That's right. They'd have the same shocked look on their face as if they were seeing Monokuma for the first time. At the moment, at that moment, a whisper crept out of Monokuma's emotionless face. There should be a limit to how disappointing you can be. It's far quieter than a mosquito's wings. Even with her battle hardened hearing, Mukuro couldn't hear what he said. Monokuma shook his head and the voice returned to normal. It's not like I care that you, the ultimate despair, has hope in anything. It's not like I expected much from you to begin with, so this'll at least help me feel despair. But seriously, you disappoint me. 
Just so you know, despair and disappointment are completely different things, okay? They're as, they're as different as bears and pandas. 